Welcome to A Conversation with History. I'm Harry Chrysler of the Institute of International Studies. Our guest today is Jean-Pierre Olof Shuri, who is Ambassador and Permanent Representative of Sweden to the United Nations. Mr. Ambassador, welcome to Berkeley. Thank you very much. Where were you born and raised? I was uh, born in a small town of Norrköping in Sweden by a Swedish mother and a Swiss father. Uh -huh. But uh, they only stayed there for six months. And then we settled in the southern part of Sweden called Malmö opposite to Copenhagen, where there is now a bridge. Mm -hmm. And what, uh, looking back, how did your parents shape your thinking about the world? Oh, very much so, indirectly by their life, so to say, because uh, my mother met my father in France when he was doing uh, his um, practice for becoming a hotel director. Hmm. He, was, he was a good Swiss, you know, he went to hotel school, like Mr. Ritz, the <laughs> famous Swiss. And um, there they met, she was au pair, one of the first au pair girls, I think, from Sweden that went to Paris. They met and uh, they married. And um, so he was in the hotel business. They had a small hotel uh, after the war in Sweden because they left the, the Côte d'Azur, the Riviera, French Riviera. She was, my mother, afraid of the war was, was coming. So they left in 37, came mm -hmm. to Sweden and uh, bought a small hotel. That small hotel was like a microcosmos because you had mm -hmm. all kinds of nationalities coming. The hotel got uh, known as an international place where you could speak your language and mingle with the uh, uh, owners, my mother and my father. So I met a lot of people mm -hmm. from all over. So you were sort of born to multiculturalism and multinationalism? Indeed. And, uh, and also Malmo is opposite to Copenhagen. So you took the ferry, which was uh, half an hour, uh, an hour to go across to Denmark. And there was the train station, the central train station, which was the door to the continent. You could go mm. down to Paris or wherever in a rather short time. But to the hotel came people. The first Chinese cooks to Sweden came and stayed there. Mm. Hungarian world champions in, the, in tennis, uh, mm. table tennis, the magicians, uh, Egyptian belly dancers, uh, the shipbuilders from uh, Czechoslovakia. So you got them all. And that was a fascinating world for a young boy to see. Mm -hmm. And what about your formal education? Where were you educated? And the University of Lund uh, in southern Sweden. And then uh, I did also a stint at um, the University of Stockholm later on. And what led you into politics? It was a uh, coincidence, uh, you know, just uh, the haz hazard because I was a tour leader in Tunisia for a Swedish uh, a travel agency. And I was going to replace a man who had, been, who had fallen sick, so I went to replace him. And we talked for about three days before he left. And he was engaged in politics, in student politics. He mm. was a social democrat. And he thought it was a shame that I would be down, in, in, down south uh, <coughs> just enjoying student life. Uh, I spoke languages, which uh, not much of his uh, friends did. Uh, so he said, you should come to Stockholm and join the Social Democrat Student Club and get engaged. And what turned me to that was his argument about the nuclear uh, threat. Mm -hmm. uh, Sweden, as you know, uh, just took the decision in 1968 not to produce a nuclear bomb. Uh, there was a big debate around that, whether we should have one or not. We could do it, actually. But, uh, so I got very much engaged in that uh, against the nuclear bomb. And he was the one who uh, convinced me of that, and that the party, the Social Democratic Party, and the politics, so to say, would be one way of participating in that struggle. And did you have a leadership role in, in student politics and, and in the party, or was it only once you formally joined the Social Democratic Party as an adult? Well, leadership, it, it trained me, so to say. It, yeah. it educated me because I was international secretary in the Student Club of Stockholm, which was not a big deal, but it was um, fascinating because this was around just before 1968 and during the 60s, late 60s, which was uh, we know, a period of turmoil of mm -hmm. uh, real uh, interest. 
But um, then I, after that, I was uh, asked to join the Social Democratic Party as an assistant international secretary. And that's how I got to know Olof Palme, who was then Minister of Education. And that was the beginning. Mm -hmm. and, and he was really your mentor in, in Social Democratic uh, politics, and, and you worked with him for a number of years. Yes, he, he was. I mean, he, there were also a couple of others, but he was the shining star, so to say. Uh, because he was constantly pushing an agenda, uh, opening windows, so to say. And we were pretty isolated, I would say, in Sweden at the time. We had been very active in different solidarity movements because uh, the Social Democrats had a <coughs> the government for such a long time and internationalism was in the blood, so to say. Mm -hmm. It was directed towards Spain during the Civil War <coughs> and uh, Finland and uh, the neighbored, uh, and then of course the war. But uh, Palme, he had also an experience from the third world, from Vietnam, from Africa, and from communist uh, Europe. So he was very much engaged and, uh, and was a real internationalist, and uh, as, as well as he was a nationalist, in the sense that he was very much involved in domestic policy. And that's how I learned how Domestic policy and foreign policy are one and the same thing, and you cannot. You must have the same message, the same values for it, and you cannot hmm. go on being a progressive person at home and then be conservative abroad, or the other way around. You must mm -hmm. have the same message. Now, you you were in the Swedish Parliament and then in, in the European par Parliament for a brief period. Talk a little about the the politics of doing what you just described. That is, because uh, it, it, uh, it is often the case that uh, politicians don't make the same speech to the domestic audience in a way. Is, does that come naturally in Sweden, or is there a kind of political education that's involved in your work as a legislature? When you have a constituency, you were, I believe, on the, you know, the Foreign Affairs Committee, uh, and so on, and uh, t talk a little bit about that set of problems of, of legislating about foreign policy in a democracy. Yeah, well I think that Sweden was kind of uh, unique that it was first of all not member of NATO among the democratic European nations, uh, and uh, also we had a long rule of social democrats and the first party leader we had, who also became our first prime minister, social democratic, Yalma Branting, who got the Nobel Peace Prize, uh, by the way, for his work on the League of Nations. For him, his message from then was that we cannot do anything sustainable at home unless we also contribute to a safer world. Mm. And that was not by military means, but by values and by solidarity. And this was also strongly imbued in the Nordic uh, context. And all the Nordic countries were more or less social democratic for a long period. So this, mess, this is very important to understand. A constant message of international solidarity and uh, linked to the national start. It was the mm. same struggle for the workers in, 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 mm. in, uh, in Sweden to, be, to have eight hours working day, the right to vote, and then also women's vote. Uh, the same struggle, the same values abroad. So the others should also have it in our part, hey, South Africa, for instance. And Yalma Branting also, in those days, he was involved in mm. Southwest Africa in the, at the League of Nations to get you know, them free from uh, South Africa. So I've noticed that very often in this country, mm -hmm. when you often see, hear from leading politicians, we can't do that because the people wouldn't approve it. Well, but there is no message from the top, so to say. Mm -hmm. It's like democracy, you must reconquer it every day, and you must reconquer that sense of solidarity in the nation, between nations, uh, also every day is a constant. So this was there, so to say, has been in the Swedish society for a, a, a long, long time. And um, when I came into politics, it was first through the party, I would say, the student movement, as I said, and then I started to work for, uh, with Olof Palme, and then later on for him. So I was very much a, a creature within the, the cabinet in the, in, the um, in government before I became a parliamentarian. I became a parliamentarian when the Social Democrats lo lost the elections in 1976 for mm. a brief period of, well, for six years. And, and, and then uh, I came to the European Parliament because, uh, bef just before I went to the UN. 
uh, after having served in the government. And, and, and talk a little about this relationship with Europe, because Sweden did become a member of uh, uh, the European Union, and uh, its, its traditions seem to be so distinctive, working with others but, but carving out a, a unique role. Uh, w was that a, different, a difficult choice for Sweden? Uh, uh, to, to join uh, uh, the Union? Yes, it was. Uh, the reason why you heard of Sweden in international affairs during the Cold War was that we were non-aligned, military non-aligned. Not ideologically, we were part of the Western civilization, but military non-aligned. And that in combination with a person like pa Palmer who used the word and uh, the tribune to to get his ideas out at home and abroad, uh, gave uh, Sweden a certain, came into the spotlight because we spoke out more mm -hmm. than others did. We didn't, we were not confined by NATO solidarity, you know, lowest common denominator. We could speak out against human rights violations. We could speak out against Franco dictatorship and Salazar dictatorship when it was not appropriate to mm -hmm. do it in the European setting. Everything was geared t towards the communi communists. But we could speak out against the communists too, against mm -hmm. the war in Vietnam, against the war in mm -hmm. Afghanistan and so on. So, so uh, I think that uh, that is, um, is very important. And um, I think also that uh, the European Union, when the debate came, we felt a bit out of it because so many of the EEC before the European Union, when it was the EEC, uh, was so much linked to NATO in a way. So there was a kind of a reluctance to, to join him. But Palmer, he saw this, mm -hmm. there is a new time coming up. And, with, with, uh, and he prepared, he was prepared to join Europe, so to say, and, and take a risk. But the Swedish public opinion, especially women, I would say, most women who work, and there are 85% of them do in Sweden, are working in the public sector. They, there is a feeling that if you join Catholic Europe, which mm -hmm. is not true, but I mean this was the perception, mm -hmm. then that would hit your social welfare system. Mm -hmm. You would have to harmonize taxation and then cut down taxes and so on. And so, on. so there was this reluctance. But I think Palmer and we were for your joining the European Union the EC at the time, saw it more as a being member of a wider Europe. It's a matter of solidarity and of the, for the future. And we joined in 1995, but there was an opinion against up to the very last month, with, and it was turned around and we got 51% for joining in the referendum, uh, only because of an active leadership role by Palmer's successor, Ingmar Carlsson. For a brief period, you were a legislator, I think, in the, in the European Parliament. How did that differ uh, from your, your role as a parliamentarian in, within Sweden? Was there a difference? Yeah, well, it's, it was at a, a different level, so to say. Still, we believe in Europe that national parliaments have the basic role. But some of the issues we coordinate and harmonize. The European Parliament is unique in the sense that there you had 15 nations, 626 representatives from 15 nations, uh, with 626 different temperaments, I tell you. And <laughs> we were talking and debating the future of Europe every day, and that, which makes Brussels a unique place. There is the only place where you actually discuss Europe, Europe's future every day in this international context. So you, you create kind of a common citizenship, although you have, it's based upon parties, you have one socialist group with social democrats and socialists from all of the year, 15, and now it'll be the 25th, 1st of May, and you have a conservative bloc, including Christian Democrats. But it's a first, it's the embryo to a European parties, really. So the difference is, in, in national parliaments, you, you create real laws, so to say. In the, in the European parliament, you are the democratic watchdog over the Commission and on the European mm. Council, the ministers. You, what you have, you have two prime responsibilities and duties there, is that you are the body that accept or reject new members, important for Turkey, for instance. And finally, you're also the one who, at the end of the European Parliament, approves of the budget, of the whole budget. And there are times when the Parliament can actually block 
the whole function of the European Union and the Commission by not accepting a budget or wanting to negotiate a shift or redistribution. Mm -hmm. is, is there a case where the, the, Euro the European consensus and being part of the European Union has, has led to a change in Swedish foreign policy? Or have you been able to maintain you know, this, this, this tradition that we've been talking about? Not changing, but uh, our basic tenets. But uh, of course, it's a, a shift. It's a shift in the sense that we are not so visible individually anymore. Uh -huh. We are part of a club, of a union, where you try to get a common foreign security policy, which has been rather successful up to Iraq. Iraq split us. But uh, on the questions like the Middle East, on uh, foreign aid, uh, and environment and so on, you have developed a European common position on many issues. And there within that, you, you argue, of course, before you come to a common position. And you can say that a country like Sweden, who has been very active and vociferous before, as you articulate, uh, its specific weight lowered, so to say. Uh, but you became stronger and heavier anyway, because you were then, you spoke on behalf or together with the under 15 and under 25. So I noticed when I used to travel around the world before we joined the union, we were very appreciated Sweden because we, had, we have a big foreign aid budget. But they always said thank you very much and let's do this and that together. But could you please also talk to your European friends in Brussels? Mm -hmm. and, and then when I was a minister for international development cooperation and came down as a, also part of the European Union, carried a lot of weight. You always receive by presidents and prime ministers mm -hmm. and so on and so on. So there you are. You, you, your own profile kind of gets lower, but you have more weight. 9-11 mm -hmm. uh, uh, has come upon us and seems to define a new era. Uh, uh, and you have, as the ambassador of Sweden to the UN, have, 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 have been there to watch uh, 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 these events and the changes uh, uh, within the UN. Uh, uh, let, let's talk a little about that. In other words, how has 9-11 uh, changed things for the UN as an organization and the problems that it must focus on? Well, I was uh, standing in my room on the 46th floor just opposite the UN in New York and I saw the first tower being hit. I didn't mm. know by what. It was like a small fire. And I went to an EU ambassador in meeting them. Then I called my wife saying, keep informing me what's going on, look at the TV. And then when we were sitting there among the, with the ambassadors, the message came there was a plane. And then we all rushed back to our offices. And then from there I saw the second plane. And I, then me and uh, I and my collaborators, we watched the two towers fall down. Mm. Uh, we were crying, we were, you know, everything. And we couldn't communicate with the outside world, only by email, not by phone. The, the, there was a shock, but also a strong solidarity when we realized what this was all about. And we have vigils in Sweden, like in every other place, and, and the emails you got, and uh, we had the same headlines, we all New Yorkers and all that. So, and then, but the day after, both the Security Council and the General Assembly uh, convened extraordinary session and unanimously, unanimously voted f for a resolution in solidarity with the United States and its people and for the right of self-defense. So uh, that was, you know, had we continued on that path, we would have been in a completely different situation today because we were all for that you must go at the root of the causes, which was Taliban in this case, and Al-Qaeda, and terrorism, but also to fight uh, uh, what was perhaps the uh, breeding ground for potential terrorists, uh, to fight poverty, the pre-9-11 agenda, so to say, of the mm -hmm. UN, to fight poverty, uh, poverty and to liberate people from fear and hunger and so on. So there was a strong solidarity, and, and then, of course, um, uh, some years, uh, months later, a year later, we got the war in Afghanistan, and, and uh, okay, uh, and some people wondered how long is this war going on, and, and so on and so on. But then the distraction became Iraq, which changed a lot, because uh, Afghanistan was not a finished job. 
terrorism there was not finished. And, uh, and uh, it all changed. And we have the situation we have today, today unfortunately. And um, the UN was kind of put aside. Uh, and um, we had to think about other things, how to, to match this. My first reaction uh, when, after 9-11 was to ask, how will the United States and its people handle their anger and sorrow? That will kind of decide a lot in world policy, I thought. Mm -hmm. Today, I think, how will the United States handle its superpower position? Because mm -hmm. that will also mm -hmm. decide a lot. Now, now the the uh, the the UN had an agenda before this this really uh, change in in the world's perception. To, to what extent is that agenda uh, still relevant for you know dealing with the the causes of terror? Obviously, there was a need for a military solution, and the UN recognized that. Uh, uh, up to a certain point in Afghanistan. Yeah, in Afghanistan. W what about the the uh, the the UN agenda that was in place before 9/11 and how does it inform our understanding of of the causes of of terrorism and how one should respond to it in other ways besides the military? I came in in 2000 in the fall <laughs> and that was when the millennium summit took place in New York with the largest gathering ever of prime ministers and presidents. What they did there was to adopt an agenda, the Millennium Declaration, which was based upon a, a report from Kofi Annan, Secretary General, where he had tried to analyze the threats and opportunities for the 21st century and what should be done about it. So he had about 10 points, 10 millennium development goals, which he asked them, the leaders, to subscribe to, which they did. That analysis was very interesting because a few months later, the CIA came out with a, their, their analysis, which was called Global Threats 2015. I compare the two. Kofi Annan's report and George Tenet's report. And I found they more or less spoke about the mm -hmm. same thing. But the interesting thing, the conclusion I drew, was that Kofi Annan, with his limited resources, he came up with that and he engaged the whole world for them. While George Tenet, with the best and the brightest, the, all the resources they have in the intelligence mm -hmm. community, he couldn't come up with anything better. Uh, and of course, the multilateral aspect was less prominent, uh, obviously. So. We all set about, in, in the fall of 2000, to work on these Millennium Development Goals, which were benchmarks, and Kofi Annan would report one year later on it to the General Assembly, say, this is what you have done, this is what not, you have not done, and this is what you should do. So we all saw a new bright future of energy, and to combat and meet all the challenges and threats of the new century. Terrorism was also there, but not so much. Then, of course, a year later, he couldn't deliver his report, it's thought, because of 9-11. But, uh, but uh, it was there. And that agenda, mm -hmm. the pre-9-11 agenda, is still there. Mm -hmm. Poverty, HIV AIDS, environment, rule of law, and so on. And uh, so-called fragile states and what to do about it. So it's still there, it must come back, and hopefully it will now, but uh, there is a distraction, and that is Iraq, of course, which sucks up so much energy, so much resources, so much political m emotions. Tell us a little about how Sweden's foreign policy and, and the kinds of commitments you had talked about earlier uh, coming out of your party related to that millennium agenda uh, and and uh, because when, when one looks at the record, Sweden really, across the board for a small state, has really uh, uh, takes a leadership role in many of these areas. And at, at one level, it's surprising. One always thinks that, that it's only the major powers who can contribute. Well, we, in 1962 already, uh, we set up the 0 0.7 goal of, uh, of GMP for foreign assistance, because we saw that as part of our national security policy. Uh, that as long as you have injustices and poverty and conflicts out there, we can never in the long run just develop our own society behind mm -hmm. walls or under a glass. Uh, 
-hmm. so, so this was in 62, and that was Olof Palme. He was secretary of that group. It was the same time when the war of poverty started in this mm -hmm. country, or was announced by Lyndon B. Johnson and Michael Harrington, which inspired, we knew Michael Harrington, uh, Palme met him too, and that inspired us too. But there were two wars on poverty. Ours in 62 was on, against world poverty, mm. because we had already kind of gotten started on our own society. When Lyndon's was war on poverty, which was obvious then, again, there was a war which disturbed that. Vietnam, of course. But uh, uh, so over the years, we have set aside a lot of money uh, for development and cooperation. And I think it, we made a difference in many fields where other countries kind of held back. The anti-apartheid struggle, for instance, we were early on involved in humanitarian support and legal support to the ANC, and that counted also for the liberation movements, and uh, I think that was very important. And, and why has uh, uh, your country been an important leader at the UN? It really has. I mean, it, it's, it, is it, again, this, this set, what, what your, th this link between domestic and, and foreign policy and, and yeah. uh, uh, Sweden's own internal values? We believe that as a small nation, before we were in the e European Union, we needed an international organization like the, uh, the UN. And, and it, we have always said that the UN is a cornerstone of our foreign and security policy. Uh, we need collective action and collective solution for uh, for collective problems, so to say. Uh, so therefore, we have, we, together with the other Nordic countries, contributed a lot to UN programs. Together, as much as the US, by the way, and we are major donors, of, you know, like, like fifth or sixth or tenth in the world, uh, to all the different programs because we believe in it, in the in the, in the UN. Uh, we also need that the UN needs reform now, just like the EU mm -hmm. expanding its membership now needs to deepen and, and change and its structures. The UN needs radical reform. There's a lot of internal inertia, while there's a lot of external energy at the UN with all the peacekeeping operations and so on. But, but it's the only organization where you have legitimacy, sustainability, impartiality, and um, universality. And, and, and Sweden has always made a contribution to the the peacekeeping forces either in the form of, of, of boots on the ground or in terms of expertise yeah I mean uh, there has been about there have been about 800,000 peacekeepers since they were started actually under Dag Hammarskjöld the Swedish Secretary General and Ralph Bunch by uh, 800,000 we have had about 10 percent of that which shows a lot of our commitment there was done uh, hill uh, in uh, some years ago and now we're coming back with a vengeance I was said we are now in all the peacekeeping operations in Africa in one and diff uh, other form but uh, yes we, it has been a tradition uh, the problem is I think for peacekeeping is now that it's mainly third world countries who are contributing and uh, and 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 uh, you see uh, uh, European countries and industrial countries not wanting to go in so much in Africa, for instance, where mm -hmm. all the main, uh, main peacekeeping operations are. And we have to rectify that to show that we are not, you know, uh, Europeanized, so to say, or just uh, take care of the Balkans and not uh, want to engage in, in Africa. I think that is changing now. It needs changing. Now, you, you personally have been involved in, in some of the operations of supervision of elections, uh, for example, in, in Zimbabwe. Uh, talk a little about that and, and, and uh, uh, how your role as a Swede and your role as an emissary of, of the UN, how, how those interface uh, to, to contribute to uh, uh, to, to working towards some resolution, but in, in, in some cases, like Zimbabwe, the, the issues are not resolved. Yeah, uh, I was uh, chosen as the uh, head of the EU election observation mission when I was in the European Parliament. And this was in 2000. Uh, these were for uh, parliamentary elections. And uh, this was based upon, as it always is with such uh, observation missions, with the consent of the government there, 
And uh, what they hadn't figured on is what, that we would come in with s such a great number. We came in with two, over 200 people, mm. and we came in early, and we stayed on. And we were serious, and we mm. had a good operation. I felt like it was always almost a military political operation because we have security mm. people, and we had you know, logistics and so on. And I think we made a good job. There were a lot of other uh, observation missions there. The Carter was there, and, uh, and the Commonwealth and Southern Africa uh, development. Uh, cooperation with that. But I think we made a difference because we were out all over and uh, linked up with 13,000 national observers, national observers linked up with them. And when we delivered our final evaluation that these had <coughs> not been free elections, uh, uh, and um, now it's important how the president with all his power deals with this. Mugabe, yeah. yeah. And I was chosen also, I think, because I knew Mugabe, and Sweden had cooperated with his liberation struggle and so on. But um, they didn't like that, of course, at all, what we said. And uh, the demand, we demanded changes for the elections coming up in 2002, which were presidential elections, of course, much more important for Mugabe the Electoral College and things like that. They had to change and democratize and demilitarize and have more observers. So when I was sent back again by the EU in 2004, there was a lot of resistance, of course, from the... They didn't mm. say no, but they didn't say yes. Mm -hmm. But we used that uh, non-answer by going there, using the cooperation agreement you have between Zimbabwe and the European Union, or it's rather the European Union and all the count 70, over 70 countries in Africa, <coughs> Caribbean and the Pacific, which has a kind of a partnership deal, the so-called Cotonou Agreement, which says that, yes, we are provider of solidarity, of support to build up your societies, but you have also to develop good governance and things like that. Among those were also accepting observation missions from other mm. countries in election time. So we used that. But I spent a very tough week there together with my uh, colleagues and they did everything to sabotage. In the end, they just uh, pulled back my, my, uh, <coughs> my visa and uh, put a, a, another visa in which expired the day before. Mm -hmm. So I had to leave after a week. And um, they were afraid that we would redo the 2000, be very efficient and see what all the violence which was there and we would condemn it and so on. But um, we were not intrusive. This is what Mugabe tried to sell to the African countries, is that the EU, the white men, came in there and mm. blah, 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 this is the way you should do democracy. No, we were using this partnership contract which we have. We cannot go on providing support and solidarity if you violate the contract when it comes to human rights, democratization, and so on. Mm -hmm. uh, this raises an interesting problem, which is the, the timing of the UN interventions. One, one has the sense that uh, there is a, an opportunity before every, everything falls apart, before things has, have, have coalesced into a disaster. It seems to be more difficult in the period of monitoring where there isn't, uh, say, a military force to, uh, to make things go the right way, or if in, in the case of Zimbabwe, there, there isn't cooperation on the other side. But then, so the, the opportunity for intervention seems less. But then, when everything falls apart, there's a disaster, a tragedy, that, uh, that the UN then seems to be able to, to offer appropriate intervention. And, and the Congo may be an example of, 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 this, uh, of this sequence. Is that a fair uh, analysis or, or not? Yes, it is. Uh, in 1999, Kofi Annan drew the conclusions from the UN and the world community's failure in Rwanda, where 800,000 people were massacred in 100 days, and of Srebrenica and, and Kosovo, that there is a, something wrong with a system which says you see a genocide coming or massive ethnic cleansing, but you cannot do it because you are not allowed to interfere in other countries' mm -hmm. internal affairs according to the UN Charter. So you need to adopt that because you cannot stand by watching this anymore. No more Rwandas. 
he got a lot of reaction, negative reaction that mm. from several members at the UN because they feel this is a, again a white man's intrusion into internal affairs just to set the standards and impose things. So you need to find a different way of doing this because you need to prevent, you need to prevent uh, uh, genocide uh, and so on. So what has happened is that after a conference in Stockholm last January, uh, on prevention of genocide organized by the Swedish government of Prime Minister Björn Persson. Uh, Kofi Annan came and he delivered a speech where he said, I'm going, we have to deal with this and I'm now going to nominate a special advisor to prevent genocide mm -hmm. and ethnic cleansing and who will work with me and the Security Council. Because the resistance has been a lot also in the General Assembly. But in Security Council of course too, where we couldn't intervene in, in Rwanda, but this special advisor and Kofi Annan will add more strength, I think, and more accent and with the support of many member states now. So we have to do this. And in the Congo, it's a different uh, problem uh, because when the UN intervened a couple of years ago, two years ago, it was chapter six mandate, which means you can intervene to keep the peace but not to shoot at people who are, who are attacking civilians or uh, protect civilians more robustly. And that didn't hold. So finally last summer, uh, the UN Security Council took a new resolution, Chapter 7, where you now also can do that and you can pr protect uh, civilians, you can work for human rights, for gender issues, you can help to develop the local uh, society, you get the UN family in with the UNDP aid money and so on and, and donors and so on. And uh, that is very important because it's not only peacekeeping anymore. You cannot have just a peacekeeping thing, it won't hold. Mm -hmm. You must have peacekeeping and post-conflict reconstruction, which in fact turns out to be nation building, if you so want, to support nation building. And uh, you, so you have, must have a diff much wider perspective on peacekeeping. Otherwise, if you just go in, keep the peace, and then after a while leave, it would come back again, like in Haiti, mm -hmm. which, where you left the whole thing unfinished. This has been difficult for, for Security Council members to accept s certain Security Council members in the sense that they think it's too much a long-term commitment and do we really like these people? Or do we want to put money into mm -hmm. it? And should we be global social workers or whatever? Do you, and, and what is your answer to that? Do you believe that, that these multilateral, uh, multinational ways of responding are the best way? Or do you believe that uh, particular designated states can do the best job? Designated states, no way. That's the Roman <coughs> Empire. I don't, mm -hmm. We don't want that. Mm -hmm. We need, uh, we need uh, to engage as many as possible and to ha get legitimacy. There is, uh, I mean, a, a, a formula for that. That is the Security Council is there to, to, to handle peace and security issues. And uh, you can also, which is more and more the case now, engage regional organizations like ECOVAS in Western Africa, where local assets, national assets, together with the support of the UN, uh, keep the peace and develop nations. And um, this is the only way of doing it. And, and now, I mean, Haiti is a very interesting case because it came, happened quickly after hands off, and then choop, all of a sudden you were there, and at least it was out. And the local regional organization, who was engaged, uh, was just totally ignored. Mm -hmm. That's not a way of doing it for a sustainable solution. And hopefully we can get it all together again, but um, that was a quick fix, which uh, I, uh, I don't know uh, why it happens. Well, I think I know, but uh, it was not the right way of doing it. Let's hope to we can do it anyway. But um, you need to have legitimacy. It's a secure, only the Security Council can authorize the use of force in order to uh, keep the peace. How do you evaluate the UN's performance in the build-up uh, uh, to the Iraq war? Uh, it seems to have done its job very well uh, in, in the sense of moving on weapons of mass destruction, uh, bringing uh, uh, your fellow Swede Hans Blick in to run the operation and so on. But, but, but in the end, the UN lost out because the, uh, I mean, in, in the terms of, of uh, uh, leading the way to a peaceful resolution, and, but 
it seems not because of a fault of its own. There seems to have been a vigorous debate, uh, a, vi a vigorous mechanism for continuing the process so there wouldn't be war, but, but then uh, it, it all fell apart. But give us your analysis. Well, I followed it very closely all the time because although we were not members of the Security Council, at the weekly EU ambassadorial meeting, we analyzed it in full, and the other EU members who are in the Security Council are obliged by EU rules to inform and consult mm -hmm. with us. And, I mean, we had not exhausted the peaceful diplomatic way. Uh, the inspections went on, they started to destroy some rockets, missiles, as you remember, but they had, couldn't find the real thing, so to say, but put very concrete questions to the, to the Iraqis all the time. And um, Leakes, in the end, asked for another three months in his last late uh, statement there, and he didn't get it. Uh, and instead we got, uh, got a show at the UN uh, saying there are this and that and mobile laboratories and whatever, uh, which was misleading. Uh, I'm not sure what would have happened if uh, it, after three m more months, Blix would have said, well, if he had said there are weapons of mass destruction, that's one thing. It is said, we haven't found it, give it more. Mm. I mean, there was, these were very effective, and the previous mission, UMSCOM, had destroyed mainly, basically a lot, a lot more than was destroyed during the Gulf War. So we, we don't know what would have happened with the UN, but the Security Council, the majority, they did absolutely the right thing to resist, to give authorization to a war when there was no need for it at the time, when we have not exhausted all other methods, when there was no imminent threat. And um, so I think it was not, it was a setback for the UN as such, of course, but it was not a defeat. It was, uh, it was I think, others who should take that blame. As a person who, who must have uh, thought a lot in your various roles uh, in Sweden about the U.S. and the world, uh, what do you make of, of this uh, new uh, high noon go-it-alone uh, strategy of, of this administration? And when and how do you think the U.S. will, uh, if it will, move back into to working with the international community, which, it, which really has been the tradition of all administrations uh, since the end of World War II. Well, I came here in 2000 to the UN as ambassador. My first ambassadorial post uh, almost at the age of 60, mm -hmm. because this is the only place I want to be mm -hmm. uh, an ambassador, because I love New York. And for me, the United States, ever since I was a young sailor here at the age of 14, mm -hmm. came to Oakland, by the way, San Diego. 14? 14. Mm -hmm. uh, San Diego, a mess boy. But, I mean, I was imbued by jazz, by comics, by uh, Steinbeck, Holden Coldfield, whatever, and films. So this was, you know, part of, so for so many Europeans, and Sweden was the most Americanized society in Europe, they used to say, American companies tested all the new products there and so on and so on mm -hmm. for the European market. And coming here, it was, of course, the same feeling. I, ha I have this in my bones, you know, like so many Europeans have. And uh, we have had the Vietnam War, okay, we have the contrast. These were under specific circumstances. And coming here now, you know, a lot of enthusiasm. Iraq has changed so much, and we wonder uh, in Europe, is this an aberration? Will it happen, something, those things happen again, or is this just a one-time thing? And uh, this, the politics of today seem to have a melange, a mixture of political conservatism and religious conservatism, which have come together. We haven't seen that before. Mm -hmm. And it's something we, we look at with some apprehension because we don't recognize it. And it's not the United States that we used to know, so to say. But uh, this does not mean that we are anti-American. Uh, but on the, on the um, other hand, we are very American, mm -hmm. <laughs> pro-American. And uh, we, want to, we, we, we want to be partners. We need to be partners 
for all the global challenges we have. And, and we need the United States inside the United Nations. And we, we, we need to work together. Mm -hmm. And, and do, you, do, you, do you see the forces in the United States that might tilt back to this uh, 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 working with the UN uh, uh, that existed in the past? Yeah, I'm sure. But uh, of course, 9 11 is such a unique thing. I mean, so, mm -hmm. such a dramatic thing, which um, a lot of people, of course, support the Iraq policy out of goodwill or, or rather out of, they think it's, it's the, the thing. But um, sure, I mean, I, the, the debate is very uh, strong here, very lively. And uh, the other America is still there. Mm -hmm. This this European caucus within the UN, how uh, how does that contribute to a common understanding of the United States and, and a, a common understanding of where Europe wants to go in the UN? Here at the UN, there's a, I think a pretty good understanding because we yeah. live here, we 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 mingle with, uh, interact with our American colleagues. But what struck me when I was in the European Parliament and also in the Swedish Parliament is. Uh, the lack of contacts, actually, and uh, so many prejudices and lack of knowledge about the United States. Mm. And I found that also in Washington, mm -hmm. uh, perhaps even more. Uh, la prejudices, lack of knowledge and information and contacts. So I took the initiative uh, two years ago to set up a, a seminar in Brussels with American opinion makers to meet with the European Parliament. Mm -hmm. And that was very, very good. But then the Iraqi war came. Mm -hmm. Does the U.S. Uh, sorry, not the U.S. The U.N. have a role in sort of cleaning up after the elephants, so to speak, in in Iraq. I mean, to 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 help put together the the uh, uh, the institutions and and the future of Iraq in in the wake of uh, uh, U.S. policy there. If it is allowed to do it, mm -hmm. I mean, it's not a role that the U.N. seeks to clean up after the elephant. Uh, the UN opposed the war and suffered a lot uh, from the attack against its headquarters last summer. But uh, it's also an obligation to assist people in need, the humanitarian aspect. Mm -hmm. How you, but the question is, can the UN and its member states deliver on the humanitarian aspect and to support a process under present circumstances? That is the question. And is there a will to allow the UN to mm -hmm. do it all the way? I mean, we cannot be seen as a cleaning person doing uh, the mopping up while there are still other forces under, under guidance which we don't know where they are going. Mm -hmm. and, and is security the big issue now? I mean, in other words, not that it is the end all, but, but it is the, the condition for doing the, the kind of work that you're talking about that the UN might be good security at. Security is, of course, the basic thing. And, mm -hmm. and we have experienced over the last year years that for the first time the UN is targeted, mm -hmm. not only in Iraq, in Afghanistan too. And uh, this is not the role that the UN should have. The UN must be an independent body, seen as an independent, for what it is, an independent body with no other agenda than to assist people in need. And uh, therefore there must be, you cannot have a collusion or the, uh, this, to be seen to be working under the, under or very close to the occupying powers. You need a new resolution, you need a new definition, and you need a new acceptance in Iraq for that. You mentioned uh, Swedish interest in reform in the UN. What, what uh, do you see as the most pressing reform uh, required uh, for the UN if it's going to assume you know, a, a whole set of new tasks which this new era seems to invite? Yes, we must have the legislative means, so to say, uh, to intervene before a conflict appears, <coughs> and uh, also to uh, act, in this case, against terrorists and uh, weapons of mass destruction in a more forceful and uh, preventive way. Not preemptive, but preventive. Mm -hmm. By diplomatic civilian measures first. Uh, that is the most important question. The other question is that you need to make the UN as such more f uh, functional, more modern 
in internally. You cannot continue uh, in the same way as you did in San Francisco after San Francisco. Just like in the European Union, you cannot continue with six or 10 or 15 members uh, when, when you get 25 or more. So there are two different reforms, political reforms, you can say, and structural reforms. And the, it, it needs to be done, let's say, as soon as possible. And that's why Kofi Annan appointed this panel of personalities to come up with some draconian uh, resolutions. Uh, because uh, you cannot achieve it inside the, the UN. There are so many different uh, uh, wills, and uh, the, there is a reform group on the Security Council official and open-ended where all the nations participate. It's been worked for 10 years and produced nothing. Mm -hmm. And what about the Security Council? More members? Different yeah, members? Yeah, I mean, that's, I mean, everybody ex accepts that, that you need to expand it to get a more regional representation, uh, which corresponds to the membership. But not necessarily to have too many, because uh, you need an efficient uh, Security Council. We have proposed as a nation, Sweden, that you could, it's important to get movement in this. It has been a total stalemate. And we have proposed to have, uh, f let's say, add five or some more non-permanent members without a veto, right? Because this is the question immediately that the veto powers, the P5, mm -hmm. the, the permanent five, they, op they are not happy to have more in who have the veto power. So, so let's say, let's add five without a veto power. And then we will see after some years if we can, you know, come to a wider reform if the political context is different. But let's get some movement. It's absolutely necessary. One, one final question. How would you advise students to prepare for the future if, if they want to participate in a, in a multi uh, uh, national, multilateral world uh, where there are going to be a lot of problems? Well, first of all, to be informed, to be informed, I mean, to, to, to uh, read uh, uh, newspapers which give you a, a f fair picture of the world, and to be engaged on your, uh, on your local level in something which is beyond yourself, mm -hmm. to take an interest in something beyond yourself uh, for the benefit of others. Whatever that is, I think it's good. And, uh, and then to also be informed. I mean, you are not, you can contribute if you want to, but you cannot change the world perhaps alone, but there will be some point you will find when you have, when you're fully informed, which a student should be, about what's going on, to take a decision. And there are so many scholarships, programs, interchanges going on. So if you want to do it, you can do it. Well, Mr. Ambassador, with, uh, with that uh, uh, positive note, thank you very much for being here and, and, and sharing this uh, uh, story of your intellectual odyssey and, and your work ending up at the UN. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. And thank you very much for joining us for this conversation with history.